we're going to talk about automating uh, binary analysis with uh, Ghidra's P code. Yes, and my name is Gergely Rewey, or Gary for short. Um, I do security research at Siemens. Um, I sometimes do tutorials on YouTube. Um, yeah, that's me. And about the talk. Uh, so first of all, um, so in this presentation, we are going to talk about uh, Ghidra and its intermediate representation called uh, P-code. Uh, first, a quick disclaimer. I'm not a Ghidra expert. Um, I use it time to time. Um, and then I had a project on, on backdoor detection, which kind of led me to the direction of Ghidra because, of, because it's free and open source. And that also, that also led me to, to work with P-code. And I was positively surprised um, by you know, how well P-code worked and how well Ghidra worked for, for this stuff. So that's why I thought that it makes sense to, uh, to talk about it a little bit more, because I think it could be really useful for anybody who wants to automate stuff in, in reversing. Um, so uh, the first part, I will very quickly introduce Ghidra, and then I will talk a little bit more about Ghidra scripting, and then we'll spend, spend most of the time on uh, talking about, about uh, P-code, and um, there will be a couple of examples as well, so that we not just look at slides. All right. Um, so, if you don't live under a rock, then you probably heard about Ghidra. That's the NSA's um, reversing framework that uh, everybody was super suspicious about when it came out, but then NSA open sourced it, and now all is good. Um, ultimately, it's a very powerful um, a tool, and it's a great competitor for Ida Pro, Bider Ninja, Rudder 2, and uh, all these tools. Um, and it's free, so which is a great plus. Um, in my particular project, I choose it because I didn't know where my, my tool is going to be deployed. So I didn't want to be bound by you know, the licensing uh, um, stuff with, with the co commercial tools. So I wanted to use something uh, open source. Um, and you know, Ghidra so seemed like a, a, a great candidate. Um, and it turned out to be uh, true. So um, you know, I'm, I'm glad I went with that. All right. Um, if you haven't seen Ghidra before, this is it. It's, it looks amazing. It's pretty similar to what you see when you open IDA Pro. Um, the only you know, difference at the beginning is that um, since the decompiler is built into Ghidra, then uh, because of that, the default view is the, the assembly and then the decompiled C pseudocode uh, in, in sync, uh, which is also uh, very nice. Um, and um, We'll talk about the, um, the rest of it uh, later on. I just wanted to, you know, if you haven't seen Ghidra, to, just to have a, an understanding, you know, it's a decompiler and a dis disassembler, so you can look at binaries and, and see what's happening in, in, in the binary. Um, you know, just a, a short segue. Um, you can't really see that, that but, but in this screen, I was reversing a, a, a challenge from the Flareon challenges. If you don't know Flareon, um, it's an only reversing uh, capture the flag from, from, from FireEye. And if you know Flareon, then you, know, um, you might understand how difficult it was to work on slides while I was deep knee in, in solving fire challenges. So um, if you like reversing, it still runs for a couple of weeks. Um, so check it out. It's, it's pretty cool. Just a fair warning, um, it's going uh, to suck you in, chew you up, and, and spit you out. Uh, but it's going to be fun. So, um, yeah, that was quickly about Flare. And uh, now, so this was all about Ghidra. So hopefully everybody now understands what Ghidra is. Um, a Ghidra script. Um, so Ghidra, as all the other tools, have some kind of way of extending the, the tool's functionality. I know in IDA, you have IDC and IDA Python. Um, you can automate Rudder 2 as well. Um, uh, Ghidra has uh, Ghidra scripts, what they call it. And, um, and it has totally a similar tool. Um, you, you, you can kind of define two use cases. One is that if you want to automate some kind of particular task in your manual reversing, like let's say um, you have a malware and, and it uses some kind of encoding for the strings that are in the malware or in the binary, and um, you reverse how it's decoded, and you want to automate the, the process of decoding so that every time when you see that, that uh, an encoded string is used, 
then you can just quickly decode it. And for that, you can create a Gidra script, and whenever you see such, a, such a, an encoded string in the, in the UI, then you can just run your, your script, and it will decode it for you. Um, or the other way is to try to write uh, fully automated uh, tools using Ghidra script or Ghidra itself as kind of um, like a, a reversing engine for your, for your tool or like a, a, a reversing, reversing library. Um, that was my use case, so I wanted to uh, create a standalone tool uh, without using the UI um, that, can, that can do you know, particular stuff automatically. Um, when you write Ghidra scripts, you can do it either in Java or Python, but I will talk about that later. And it has a huge SDK. Um, there is something called the Flat API, which is like a set of set of methods that are available uh, directly. Um, and there is like a, the rest of the SDK that's basically everything that Ghidra is. Uh, but again, I will talk about it uh, a little bit later on. Uh, what you see here now is the uh, script manager of Ghidra. Um, this is basically where you can um, where you can look at the scripts that are already there. Uh, you can uh, run your scripts, and you can also edit your scripts if you're not looking for any kind of fancy uh, editor. You can, you can just edit the scripts uh, in Ghidra itself. And um, as you can see, there are already a bunch of scripts in Ghidra. So if you're using Ghidra regularly, um, it makes sense to once go through all the scripts, look at them just to you know, have a rough idea what kind of functionality is available for you as, uh, as Ghidra script. Um, and the scripts also provide you um, as kind of a great resource to figure out how to do stuff in Ghidra script. So when you're writing your own Ghidra script, uh, many times you can look at other scripts to see how you know, a particular class in the SDK is supposed to be used or how a particular task uh, should be uh, implemented. All right. So quickly about Python versus Java. Um, so, Ghidra is written in Java, so the native language of Ghidra script is, is also Java. Um, but I guess the guys at NSA realized that, that not everybody likes to suffer, so they, they implemented a Python binding as well uh, in Jiten, which is not that great. So, um, it's somewhat limited and it's Python 2. Um, but there is another great uh, open source project called um, Ghidra Bridge that you can see there. Uh, which basically allows you to write your code in Python 3 and, and using the whole Python, uh, like everything that Python is. So basically you get away from, from Jiten. Um, and it works pretty well. So I, I tried it and, and, in the, and it works well. So if you're using, uh, want to write something in Python, then probably uh, a Ghidra bridge will be uh, something that's worth looking into. Um, but as much as I'm not particularly fan of Java, and the last time I actually wrote Java code was at my university, which wasn't really recently, so um, I still, you know, after a while, I, I had to come to terms with the um, with the fact that that the Java development environment for Ghidra is actually great. So I changed to Java, and I don't really regret it. Um, you know, there is a learning curve there as well, but but it actually works very well, and. Um, just to be a bit specific about why I came away from Python, is that um, with, with all of these Python implementations, the problem is that um, you know often you need to figure out what class you, you want to use or, or what method you want to use, um, and then you need to convert between or, or you know typecast convert between different classes, and this this class information or this type information is not impossible to recover when you do this in Python. Um, but obviously, this is not an, a natural thing in Python. Um, so you kind of can figure that out, but it's an, it's an additional overhead that kind of uh, slows you down. So, um, and also, like, I spend a lot of time looking at the documentation and trying to figure out how I should use those, um, those classes and methods. And um, if you use Python, then on the top of that, you, you need to also figure out how this Java code is supposed to look like in Python, uh, which is, again, also not impossible, but it's an additional step that, that slows you down. So, um, ba -ba -ba. and yeah, just one, one, one other note. Um, so Java is, uh, the Java, Java development is actually very well supported by, by you know, Ghidra or basically NSA. Um, there, is a, there is an Eclipse plugin uh, for, for Ghidra development. 
Um, so you can basically write your code in, in Eclipse. You can start Kidra from Eclipse, and you can debug your own code in Eclipse while it's executing in, in Kidra. So that's, that works really well, and it helps a lot uh, with debug, debugging that you can, you can see your code uh, running inside Kidra uh, from Eclipse. So, so that's, uh, that's pretty awesome. So uh, shortly, my recommendation is that if you, use, if you want to do something short, something simple, then you know, Python is, is cool and, and going to work great. Um, if you want to like, uh, use the whole SDK and do some kind of more complex uh, program, then you know, probably it's worth to look into to, uh, to Java and see, you know, compare how much, uh, whether it will be easier to do that in, in Java, and probably it will. All right, um, just you know, one quick word about uh, headless mode. So headless mode is basically um, the way to run Ghidra without seeing the UI. So um, this is what you, what you will use if you want to uh, create like fully automated tools uh, you know, without using the UI. Um, it's basically, in that case, uh, Ghidra is really just, a, just kind of a library uh, for your tool for you know, whatever reversing task you, you want to do. Uh, the only drawback is um, that you know starting your program is you know it lo looks pretty weird that kind of like there's a com command uh, command line on the top um, that you know it just doesn't look good so probably we'll want to do some kind of uh, wrapper script but but you know that's that's the only thing um, uh, why what it makes it a bit a bit weird. All right. Um, now let's talk about the Flat API, or officially it's called the uh, Flat Program API. Um, it's basically like a set of, um, of methods and attributes that are available for you directly if you're writing a, a Gidra script. So you don't have to instantiate any kind of class. You can just call these methods and access these, these uh, uh, fields. Um, it's around like 150 uh, methods. And um, just to understand why it's there, um, you might be familiar with the feeling when you, uh, when you find a, an either, either, either Python script or an either script on the internet and you want to use it, but it's for a specific either version, and you, can, you either have that version installed on your machine or, or you need to port that, that script to, to the newest version or the version you have, and you know, it's just a lot of overhead and, and pain in the ass. So, um, so this is exactly why there's the, the Fred Program API because they wanted to avoid this pro problem. And the, the, the rules for, for this, uh, for this uh, flat program API is that um, methods are not supposed to be removed and method signatures are not supposed to be changed. So basically that means that the, the, the script, if you write a script that only uses the flat program API, then, then probably it's gonna run in five years as well. Um, so that's pretty great. Um, and. Uh, and I mean, you see it's 150 methods, so that's quite a lot. And it kind of covers all the necessary stuff, like looking at functions, looking at memory, um, you know, re recovering data from, um, from the binary. Like there's a, there is a, a field called um, current program, and then from that you can extract all like, uh, various information about the binary that you are um, running at that point. Uh, yeah. And then there is the program API which is basically everything else that, everything that Ghidra is. So, so you can access all the classes that are used or uh, used and implemented by Ghidra. Um, so, you know, it's, it's huge and it's powerful, but it's also, uh, also overwhelming at times. Uh, but the documentation is pretty good. There is a Java doc on the internet and, uh, you know, I spend a lot of time, um, you know, looking at it, you know, sometimes on a rainy afternoon, I sit by the window uh, with the hot chocolate and, and like just looking at uh, Ghidra documentation. It's, it's, it's a lot of fun. And um, just an example of, you know, complexities. Like if you want to, if you want to do, like if you want to use an address, like a memory address in Ghidra, it's not like you can just use like a, a hex value and then say, okay, let's use this as an address. Uh, because there is a, an address class in Ghidra, so first you need to instantiate an address object using your hex value, and then you can you know, do whatever you want to do uh, with that address. It kind of makes sense, but also you know, sometimes there is time to figure out how these things um, has to be done. Um, yeah, two things. Uh, yeah, source code is also available, uh, which is again a great resource, and if you have like the 
you know, Eclipse dev environment set up, then basically you can go to any class and then say, you know, uh, go to, to definition and, um, and then it's going to open up the source code and then you can look at stuff like how this class is supposed to be used or what exactly the functions are doing. Um, so with the whole program API, uh, you kind of lose the stability that the flat, uh, the, the flat API provides. Um, because your program might, you know, break uh, with the new uh, Gitra release, uh, but it's but it's a huge resource, and basically you can do anything that's 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 done in Gitra. So you you, you can you have access to everything. Um, so w to summarize, the the program API is basically with great power comes great responsibility and some pain. Uh, first example. So. Um, and this is how a Gitra script looks like. Um, this is basically just to list the imported functions of the, um, of the binary. Um, we are going to look at it in a second. Um, just a few words about, uh, yeah, I can't show there anything. So um, as you can see, um, the base class is the Gitra script class. This is what makes your program a Gitra script. And um, then the only other thing that you need to have is a, is a run method. Once you have these two things, then you practically have a, a Gitra script. And what we do in this, um, in, this, in this script is basically, you can see that from the current program um, in line 16, um, we get the symbol table. And then from there, we can get the external symbols, which are practically the, the imported functions. Um, and then with the loop, so we get an iterator, and with the loop, we'll just uh, iterate through uh, these functions and and print them, so it's that easy. Now I will try to, yeah, all right. So uh, here we see it in Eclipse, um, and if I go here to, you know, run or debug, then I can run uh, a Gitra, and it starts Gitra, and uh, I will show it on this one. Now we are basically opening a binary. Uh, it's going to analyze it. So here, as you can see, um, here we have the assembly code, and here we, we would have the decompile code if we look at the function. Um, but to run our script, we go to the uh, script manager, and we choose our script, and say run. And hopefully it ran, and it did. So here in the console, you see that all the imported functions and the libraries um, or the DLAs are, are listed. So this is just a very uh, simple uh, example of what you can do. Now well, let's get back to slides. Oh yeah, great. I never understood why it's this this way. Anyway, so so far we talked about Gitra. We talked about what Gitra scripts are, and now we are going to talk about um, P code. Um, so P code is um, it's a register transfer language, which basically it's a, it's an intermediate representation, and it translates. Um, assembly instructions to, to a set of or a sequence of, of um, uh, P code uh, operations. Um, he, here you can see on the screenshot, uh, can I navigate, oh yeah. So here you can see on the screenshot, you can open this, you can open this, uh, this bar here where you can enable or disable different um, data on this view. And if you, if you go to P code, it looks like a button, but it's not. So don't try to left click it, you need to right click it and enable because you know it totally makes sense. Um, and once you do that, uh, you get like below, uh, all right, I will just give it down. So below each assembly instruction, you will have these sequence of uh, Ghidra operations. And the really interesting stuff with that and why it makes sense is because, because the, the P code clearly states all the side effect that in this instruction has. So, um, like imagine a scenario that, that you're looking at a jump and you want to figure out uh, what's the condition for that particular jump is. And um, 
you know, if it's if it's a jump, if it's a jump, if zero instruction, then uh, the the zero flag is going to be checked whether it's set or not, and depending on on that, the jump is going to be taken. Now, you know, most of the time, the 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 condition is just above the jump, like a compare or a te test instruction. Um, but you know that's that that's not necessarily the case, and who knows what compilers uh, can do in the name of of optimization. So it could be any kind of other instruction that says the the uh, zero flag at some point. So uh, to find out to, to find your condition in assembly, you have to know which instructions are setting the zero flag and backtrack until the first such in instruction, and then see what's happening there. Now with Ghidra, the only the advantage that you get is that you don't have to like know everything like this. You have to just go go up the the P code operations and see when was the last time when the zero flag was assigned. Here you can see, like here, uh, here it assigns the zero flag. So this is these are the the Ghidra operate uh, the P code operation, and this operation says the zero flag, and basically this is going to be what controls the the jump uh, in the next instruction. Um, so this is this is a, this is a really big advantage uh, when oh my God. this is a really big advantage when um, when using using P code, and you know. Intermediate representations are not really a new thing, so compilers use that as well. Basically, when you when you have a source code, they're going to turn the source code first to an, interme first to an intermediate representation, and then separately they will they will turn that intermediate representation to you know assembly and 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 machine code. Uh, the reason behind this is because the first part to get to the uh, intermediate representation is basically. Um, uh, architecture independent, and only for the second part have to ha, you have, have you have to care what kind of architecture uh, processor architecture you, you're going to be using, and this is the same for decompilers. So decompilers first going to turn the the assembly code to an intermediate representation, and from there they're going to turn that to uh, a C code or or some kind of uh, pseudo code. And just to make stuff more confusing. Um, there is actually two different levels of uh, P code, the raw P code and the high P code. And I didn't find like a, a very clear documentation uh, what these are. So what I'm saying is just my understanding and you know, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, basically, uh, um, or first, the, the uh, multi-layer intermediate representation is also not unheard of. For instance, as far as I know, Binary Ninja also does this, that, that um, to get from assembly to, to C, they have like multiple levels of intermediate representation where they, with each iteration, they add more uh, context to the code. And basically, this is the case here as well. When we talk about row P code, that's literally just a translation from the, of the instruction, the assembly instruction, to uh, these sequence of P code operations. And um, it's already great because, because as I explained, there, there are much more, uh, like it's, it has a structure and you have much more information than from the uh, assembly. Uh, but at this point, you don't have like higher level concepts like um, arguments or parameters or variables or uh, any of these things. You just have these sequence of uh, P code operations. And then when we talk about high P code, um, uh, it's basically the output of the decompiler. So later you're going you're gonna to see in another example that to get access to high P code, we have to set up the compiler and then we have to call the uh, high function method uh, for the, the function we want to analyze. And then we're gonna, we get a high function object back. And then with that, we can access the, the high P code of that particular function. And basically this is the closest you can get to, to the C um, representation. And um, you know, for automated uh, analysis, it also doesn't make sense to go further because here you get the you get the structure or you get the structured uh, P code, and also you get the context information that's available in the C pseudo code. So you know, you can you can have things like you know, what is the argument of this uh, of this function call, or what kind of variable is this, or you know, if you have a var node, which is like the the generalized date representation of, of uh, Ghidra, then you can ask like, where is this where is this war not defined? And you don't have to backtrack line by line on your P code or on your assembly. You can just navigate to the place where this value is is uh, is basically set. Um, so it offers it it offers much more context to to your code. 
And um, so why, why use P-code? Because it's cool, um, but no. So um, IR is not a new thing. So intermediate re representations are not a new thing. Um, obviously, the fact that compilers and decompilers also use them means that you know they kind of help in, in understanding or analyzing um, binary code. Uh, so obviously it has advantage for you if you are if you're creating an uh, an analysis tool, and um, if that's not enough for you, then 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 maybe the fact that with P code you get a kind of architecture independence because because you're moving a, away from assembly to a level where you're you're you don't care about the processor architecture anymore because you are just looking at the P code and if you can stay on that level, that could mean that that your application could deal with different architectures of, of binaries and you don't have to re rewrite your tool every time you want to use it with a, a, a different architecture. Uh, yes. All right, now everybody gets a demo. Uh, so the, the, the next example is gonna be, um, we're extending our first script a bit, a bit, bit further um, and uh, for that a little bit of background information. So um, there is this thing from Microsoft called the component object model. Um, it's, kind of like a, it's kind of like a standardized interface for whatever functionality. So for instance, um, you, can, you can get a com object for, for Internet Explorer, and then you can pragmatically um, execute uh, or, or control Internet, Internet Explorer through, through a, a com object. Um, you know, like Word uses these com objects, or Office uses these com objects all the time. Um, so it's, it's pretty, pretty popular in, in Microsoft Word. Uh, and the reason why it could be interesting for reversing it is because malware uses it uh, quite often. And the reason behind it is that like, if a malware wants to talk to some kind of uh, C2 server, then if you just look at the, and it uses the, the Windows API, then if you just look at the, the imported functions, then you see the, all the networking functions it uses, and then you can just navigate to the call sites and then see that, okay, then you can really quickly reverse the C2 communication uh, of the malware. On the other side, if the malware uses the, for instance, Internet Explorer as like um, a proxy for its C2 communication, then, then it's, it's much less obvious what's happening just because how you use the how you generally use com objects is, is not trivial and it's um, you know, not easy to, uh, to understand just by looking at the uh, assembly code. So you have to invest much more time into uh, reversing that, that binary. Like even the fact that it's, it's, uh, it's using Internet Explorer, it's not gonna be obvious when you just look at the, uh, the binary. So in this first uh, script, we just want to, um, we just want to look at the binary and see whether it uses com objects at all. And if so, then we are gonna you know, print the P code of the call site, uh, which, which you can use to uh, manual, uh, manual analy uh, analysis. It's kind of like um, a reconnaissance script to see whether, whether there is anything to do with com objects and whether you should uh, focus there, your reversing time uh, on that. All right, I will try to do this again. Yeah, and then we, uh-oh, no, there, there is. Then we go back here. So this is the, this is the second script. And basically, uh, here you can see these are the functions that are, you know, used to, to con like communicate with com object. The most important for us later will be the co-create instance. Uh, we'll see that in the, in the next um, example. And at the beginning, we do pretty much the same. So uh, we take the symbol table, we look at the external symbols, which, is, which are the imported function, and then we, we uh, iterate through the symbols. And then the only difference is that if we, if we find um, if we find a com object and or specifically the co-create instance, then we are investigating that further and we are getting the cross-references to, 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 to that function call. Um, and then we, we, are gonna, we are gonna print out the basic block. So here you can see that I'm, I'm getting a basic, basic block model for that program and then I get the 
the basic block for that particular address where that function is called. And then at the end, uh, here you see I have an instruction. So I, I iterate through the instruction of that basic block and, um, and print the P code of that uh, instruction. So let's see, we go to script manager and uh, let's run this. Oh wait, I will just like empty this one here so that it looks better. All right, run. And then we go back and here's our output. So here you can see uh, what happened. So the first com function found is the initial initialize um, that's supposed to be there. And then we found the co-create instance. So we say, okay, we're investigating co-create instance further and then checking cross refs and it, it, find a, it finds a cross reference at this, uh, at this address. So uh, we, go to, we go to that address and then we, we, um, we take the, the, the basic block of that, uh, the basic block of that address and print the P code for that basic block. So uh, for instance, here you see this is, this is your address where the cross reference was and here is the, uh, the, the call uh, operation that actually calls the uh, co-create instance function. Um, so again, at this point, you should you know, still need to you know, manually reverse what's happening here. Um, but, um, uh, but in the next example, we are gonna see, go a little bit further. I'm not sure I even have something useful on that slide. Yeah, I do. Um, so in the next example, uh, what we are doing is uh, to find out what is that that's being used as a com object? We can look up the uh, CLSID and the IID. So the CLSID is basic, or these both both are uh, UUIDs. So just a huge, you know, value. Um, but the CLSID can be looked up in the registry, and there you would see what what the, the program exactly is that's being executed uh, when this when this com object with this CLSID is used. The the IID is the interface identifier, um, which is, uh, it's a bit more trickier to use, so you probably have to Google it, what that exactly is. It identifies what kind of interface that is exactly from that COM object um, that's being used. Um, I put here, oh yeah, you can see, uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, you can see here that the, um, this is where you find in the registry uh, which which program the CLSID refers to. Obviously, if this program is installed on your machine. So, you know, if it's Internet Explorer, it's going to be there in any case, in any way. Uh, if it's something else, like if it's, it's something from, from Office, then you have to have Office installed to have this information in your uh, registry. And, um, and this is how the co-create instance function uh, looks like. So we basically need the, the first and the and the fourth um, uh, parameters of this uh, function call uh, to be able to recover this information. So that's what we are going to do. So again, I go back to, to here to Eclipse and look at the third code. And uh, yes, so here you can see that we're going to start using the decompiler because we want to do it with high P code. So at the beginning, and um, we have some, some code to set up the decompiler, and it's mostly boilerplate, um, but, but you know, it kind of shows that you're coming away from simple scripts to you know, more complicated programs. But again, it's mostly boilerplate, so you can just usually copy paste it from one, one script to, to another. And then here is the, here is the decompile function where we decompile a function, but uh, the goal is that we just call the uh, get high function uh, on, on that. Um, and, um, and with that, we get a high function uh, object, which will have all the decompiled P code available, available for us. And um, if I scroll down to, uh, to the main, to the run uh, function, the beginning is the same. So we basically look up the uh, com related functions, then we find the co create instance and um, and the uh, 
the interesting part is here. So until here, it's pretty much the same as the previous script. Uh, here we call this uh, find CLS ID and IID um, function, and then we can go to declaration. And this is basically what uh, what it does, this is what's going to get the high code for us. So here we call the decompile function. Um, and then, then we get the P codes of that high function um, as an iterator so that we can go through the P code operations. And, um, and later here, um, this is what's important. And this is what is not possible uh, if you use row P code. Because basically, you can say here, OK, here is a call operation. So give me the inputs, basically the arguments of this call op operation. So you cannot do that in assembly, or you cannot do that in, in row P code, because this is you know, the, the, um, the context, um, what, what, only, what is only available in, in high P code. And we are requesting the first and the fourth parameter, because that's what, that was the CLS ID and the IID. And basically, after that, we are just calling some uh, helper scripts uh, helper functions to uh, to turn that byte array to um, to a human readable uh, UUID. This script is limited to to you know UUIDs that are built like hard coded in a binary, but obviously you can extend it to 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 make it smarter. So I come back here to the uh, script manager, and I will oh wait I will just empty the console again and script manager. And let's run it. And uh, here we have the output. And on the top, it's exactly the same as before. Uh, and here, here we have the looking for CLS ID and IID. And this is, uh, we identified the call uh, of the co-create instance. And as you can see here, this is, this is what, uh, what the high P code is, is, looks like that we don't have just the call and then the address where we, where, what we want to call, but here we actually have the, the parameters to that function call uh, uh, listed. And you now we have information whether they are constants or like this one is like a, a register that is passed to, to that call. And obviously the first, first uh, parameter is the address of the function that we are calling. And then here at the end, we are printing the, the CLS ID and the IID. So these, these are the things that we wanted to uh, recover. Um, at this point, you can either start to Google these values or look them up in the Windows registry. Or if you are running your, your Ghidra script or on a Windows machine, that you can actually build in your Ghidra script that, uh, to look these values up with uh, Windows APIs from the registry. So you could automate one step further if you are, um, if you are uh, doing that on Windows. Um, and so again, the advantage of, of this on um, with high P code was that we can we can easily recover the um, the parameters of that function call, and we didn't have to you know um, manually look into uh, you know where these values are coming from, um, etc. Oh, yeah, so um, that's pretty much it. Um, I hope it was understandable. Um, quickly recap. So Gitra is a really powerful tool. Um, I think it's worth looking into it if, if reversing is your stuff. Um, and uh, Pcode can offer you um, some, some uh, uh, great automation possibilities. Uh, and um, you know, it's re Gitra is relatively well documented. And, um, and, and you know, at the end, you don't have to be a fanboy uh, if um, you, know, you, cho you just choose the tool for the task that you want to solve. Maybe it's Ghidra, maybe it's not, uh, but it's definitely worth to have, worth to have Ghidra and P-Code in your uh, arsenal for uh, reversing. And um, just a few references. Um, apart from the document official documentation, there is not so much stuff on the internet about P-Code itself. Um, so that's why I wanted to post here these two um, these two posts. So Alexei, Jeremy, they, they had a presentation on P-Code some time ago, uh, and this is the blog post to it. And Rolf Rolls um, uh, writes um, uh, sometimes about P-Code as well. So if you start on, on, on P-Code, you know, these are, um, it's not introductory, but, you know, these are good references to, to look into. 
And I just want to mention Carlos, my friend, who helped me with his infinite wisdom in creating this uh, presentation. So thanks very much. Um, I was Gary. Um, I think we have time for questions, although probably you're already uh, hungry. But um, let me know if you have questions. Um, if you don't have questions right now, you can reach me on any of these platforms or you know, generally here uh, today and uh, tomorrow. So thanks very much. Somebody questions? There is a question. I think you get a microphone. It's the fastest way. Let me see. Excuse me. Hi. Yeah. Um, you said that you uh, started with Python and then switched to Java. Mm -hmm. uh, any tips on how to do that? Because I'm not really a fan of Java myself either. How did, you, how did you do it? Did you learn it somewhere or did just the... I mean, I did learn Java at the university, so we had this great object-oriented programming class, which was in Java, but that was in, I think, in 2000, um, like, maybe six. So it was a long time ago. No, it's just, you know, I, I say that I'm not, a, I'm, I'm a Google programmer, so I, I kind of program using Google, so... Uh, <laughs> whatever I want to do something, I Google it. So, and it's not terrible. Uh, to be honest, I, th I thought it's going gonna, it's gonna to be worse. Um, but at the end of the day, once you set up this, um, this uh, development environment with Eclipse, then basically by saying create new Gidra script, then Eclipse is going to throw you like this template. And from there on, you just have to write your Java code to do stuff. Yeah, like, you don't have to care about um, how it's going to be executed because because Eclipse provided to you, um, but uh, but the Java code itself, yeah, you will have to Google it. Like you know, I also Googled how how to do a for loop in Java, like sure. <laughs> things like that. So um, you know, obviously, I think that's that that's how. And I'm, I mean, it wasn't bad. So I still Google a lot of stuff, but it wasn't terrible. All right, thank you. Sure. Somebody else? Yeah, there is one. Can you do here? It's going to be easier. Yeah, so I just wanted to know uh, when you write scripts uh, using P code, is P code aware of the calling convention or do you need to ask specific? Well, you are um, getting values of, out of specific par uh, parameters. Can you ask it to give you parameter one, two, and three, or do you need to ask give me array X, E X? Uh? Uh, so uh, theoretically, and, and that's what I tried to show you in Ghidra, and uh, we can go quickly back there. So this is this is the high P code you can see here. I'm not sure whether you, you see need it from, to zoom in <laughs> to see here. Here you already have the parameters. So this first value, like normally in row P code, you only have the call and the address that you're calling, and then the parameters are you know somewhere above. Um, here with high P code, you have the address and then listed all the all the parameters of that function call. And this is what like when you do get input. So that's the that's the method you call. And you tell which uh, the number of the of the parameter you want to have, and that's how you get the fourth or the fifth, uh, the, the, the the first parameter. Obviously, this isn't going to work all the time. So um, you know, sometimes it's hard, and it has also limitations. Uh, but this is how it is supposed to work. Okay. Thanks. Sure. Any more question? No, then I guess thanks for, thanks for being here and um, have a nice lunch and see you later. <laughs>